want to read by way of background to First Peter chapter 1, uh, reading from Matthew, first of all, chapter 22 and verses 1 uh, to 14. <clears throat> and then uh, from chapter 24 and the um, commonality between these two passages uh, and uh, the passage in First Peter uh, is um, salvation ready to be revealed. And so there's an urgency here in Matthew 22 and 24 about um, the readiness uh, of salvation, the readiness for salvation. Matthew 22 and verse 1. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. Again he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his own farm, uh, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. But when the king heard, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, uh, destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, Friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Then Matthew 24, verse 36. <clears throat> This chapter um, in which Jesus speaks about um, the end times, the end for Jerusalem and for the Jewish nation. But intertwined with that is the end of all time, the end of ages. So verse 36. But of that day and hour no one knows, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as <clears throat> in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know at what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief would come, he would have watched 
and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not expect. And then First Peter, <clears throat> taking up where we left off in our reading this morning, First Peter chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 13. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. <clears throat> Paul having, sorry, Peter having written about the salvation uh, that uh, God has accomplished uh, in Christ, the salvation that will be um, in its fullness, or we'll come into the full experience of it when Christ comes again. He, Peter adds now, verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not confirm, conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but made manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God, who raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass, the grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're thinking today about kept for salvation, or being kept for salvation, uh, as we look together uh, at uh, First uh, Peter and chapter 1. And so uh, we want to take up our study this evening. Uh, we want to uh, complete this um, consideration of this chapter. We saw this morning, first of all, that we are kept for salvation, in that salvation has two aspects to it, if we want to look at it from that angle. There is the already of salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, peace with God, fellowship uh, with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the already. It's real, it's powerful, it's life-changing. But there is the not yet of salvation, and that is the inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, uh, and um, that is, uh, uh, that does not fade away, that is laid up in heaven for us. And our experience of that salvation 
uh, will um, be a step closer when we die and our souls are taken immediately to heaven but ultimately the fullness of that experience of salvation will only be when Christ comes again in his glory. When in resurrected bodies and uh, in our um, uh, souls that have already been made perfect in holiness, the two unite together again. And now, or then I should say, in the new heavens and the new earth, we are in the presence of God forevermore. It's the Garden of Eden, but it's more than the Garden of Eden. And so that's kept for that salvation. We saw secondly that we're kept by the power of God. The power that we uh, see at work um, throughout the scriptures that made the world. The power that we see at work in the world. When we see an earthquake, a flood uh, or a fire um, that is um, ravaging uh, a countryside. That is something of the power of God. And it is the power of God raised that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that is at work uh, in our lives. So we're kept by this power. We're being kept by the power of God. Not kept by our own strength. Not kept by our numbers. Not kept by anything within us. But then we saw thirdly that we're being kept for salvation by the power of God through faith. And this is our acting upon and receiving uh, and, um, and uh, taking into our uh, minds and hearts and working out in our lives uh, all that God reveals to us uh, in the scriptures. So we're being kept. And uh, if you want to this evening, you can add on point four, point five, point six, because that's really what this is. It's a continuation. And we want to see now this evening, as we look at verse five and the, uh, and the whole chapter in the light of verse five, who by the power of God are being kept through faith for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's the actual order in which Peter wrote the words and sometimes order brings emphasis in language. And so we want to see now, uh, looking at this uh, and in the light of the wider context, that we're being kept, and Peter's point is, we're being kept also in the midst of trials. Being kept in the midst of trials. Look at what Peter goes on to say. In verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, that's in this salvation, in this hope, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. So Peter is writing to a people who are experiencing trials. And notice that trials uh, are not of one type only. You uh, and we, we don't all go through the same process, as it were. Sorry, we go through the same process, but not through the same individual experiences that produce that process. Notice the word various. And that means of different kinds, of different sorts. And so... For some people, uh, for some Christians, they have uh, major trials in their health and in their well-being. Uh, and um, you observe their lives and uh, sometimes you say, that person has not had a single day of good health. And that is a significant trial to have to live with. Uh, and to, to, to work out our faith in uh, and through and to keep our focus right and pleasing to God. 
But then here's somebody else, and their trial is in their uh, livelihood, in their place of work, uh, in their calling in life. Uh, and they give themselves to that with diligence. Uh, they uh, seek to honour God uh, in their business life and their working life. And yet they uh, have, as a, at the end of the day, only what sustains them. What puts a roof over their head, and what puts clothes on their back, and food in their stomach, as Paul says. Nothing more. And that is, um, that is unusual. Because typically, um, Scripture presents that when we work with our hands, uh, that we have um, uh, more than what we need. And so that is a trial uh, that that person experiences. But then, on the other hand, there are some Christians, and the trial for them is success. Getting on. Doing well. And no matter what they turn their hands to, it seems to, to turn good for them, as we would say. And you may not, we may not immediately think of um, getting on well and doing well in this world as a trial. But it is. Because the temptation, there are many temptations that lurk in doing well. There's the temptation to trust in the things that are material. There's the temptation to pride, to say, well, look at what I have done. Look at what I've achieved, like the man that had really good harvests that Jesus told the parable about. And he said, well, you know, you can sit back, you can take it easy. I have things provided for, for the years to come. And then there is, of course, the temptation as well that comes from um, the recognition by others. Because typically, people who get on and do well in this world, they are recognized and acclaimed as successes. Uh, and it's often said to them, you're great at your job. Um, you um, are very successful. Um, you should be proud. You, you should. And, and so those things can, again, uh, cause us to become elevated in ourselves. So trials, brethren, come in all shapes and sizes. And they come with differing durations as well. Uh, in God's mercy, often our trials are short, sharp bursts. But there are some trials, and they are for years. And in a few cases, they are for life. But you see... Whatever is our trial, whether it is only being able to make ends meet, whether it is ill health, whether it is persecution and people are always um, on our heels because of our faith and our witness as the Pharisees were always at the heels of Christ, um, whatever it is, um, we need to remember we're being kept. We're being kept. That uh, as we look up uh, to our God and Father in heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, he is keeping us by his power. And he's keeping us for the fullness of that salvation. The salvation that is already ours but is not yet um, uh, ours in the fullness of our experience. So uh, being kept in the midst uh, of trials. And uh, Peter tells us that trials always have a purpose. That's really important to note. They're always purposeful. Look at what he says in verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith 
may be found to praise, honour and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You see, the purpose of trials is that whatever comes to us, whether it is success or failure, whether it is joy or sorrow, uh, whatever it is, that our faith shines through. And our faith in Christ triumphs. And our faith in Christ deepens. And there is a refining that is taking place in us. Uh, and there is uh, a change that God is working in us. So uh, that um, we are more pure. We're more like Christ. Whatever is your trial tonight, whatever trial may come to you in the midst of this year, whatever trials have come to this congregation in the past, whatever trials we face in the present or into the future, let's remember they will be various uh, trials, but they're always purposeful. And in the midst of them, we are always being kept. Being kept. But then let's notice secondly this evening, being kept uh, unto obedience. Being kept unto obedience. There is an emphasis in this passage on obedience. It comes out in verse 2. It comes out in verse 14 uh, in these places explicitly. But it also comes out again uh, in verse 22. Um, so Peter is conscious that um, salvation involves not only faith, but it involves obedience uh, to uh, the Christ. Paul puts it like this in Romans chapter 1 verse 5. He talks about the obedience of faith. There's no real saving faith in your life or my life if it does not produce obedience. If it doesn't produce um, that keeping of the commandments and uh, doing the will of Christ. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And it could be that uh, Paul in Romans 1 verse 5 is talking about the obedience of the faith. But it's still the same point. That the faith, the Christian faith, is not some kind of theorizing, armchair sitting and talking and discussing doctrine and getting everything neatly packaged and into boxes. No, it's about faith, the faith that changes us, that makes us obedient to Christ, that remakes us in the image and the likeness of Christ, the man, Jesus, who walked this earth. You're probably familiar with the little wristband that uh, young people used to wear. What is it? WWD? Uh, uh, WWJD. What would Jesus do? And yes, the armband can sound a bit trite, but the thought behind it uh, and the aim of it is a good one. We should think continually. In the situations we're in, the trials we're in, the opportunities we have, the challenges we face. What would Jesus do? Lord, what would you have me do? That's a prayer that's prayed again and again in scripture. Lord, what do you want me to do? Because he wants us to live in obedience. And um, um, we're told of Christ himself. In his human nature, Hebrews 5 verse 8, he learned obedience. He learned obedience. And we sometimes say of a child, a baby, and, and as we begin to train our children, or we have maybe some input into our grandchildren, uh, we say, 
They have to learn obedience. They have to learn when mom or dad says no, that no means no. And they have to learn the positive, that when they're, uh, they're asked to do something, that they do it with a willing, compliant heart. Um, and so Jesus learned obedience. He learned um, that when the father said no, the things that the father said no to for the human race, he himself was bound by that no. And the things that the father um, commanded uh, and sought in human beings, those were the things that the father was seeking in him. And so he lived in this life of obedience, rejecting and embracing, rejecting and embracing. And you see, that's what uh, Peter is talking about here, is it not? Because look at what he says in verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. In other words, get your, get your mind thinking, get your mind focusing on, get your mind filled with what? Being sober, resting your hope upon the grace that is to be brought to you as obedient children. So the mind is to be filled of these things so that we will live them out. Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. So there's the saying no that comes that is part of obedience. And you and I, the purpose of God for our lives in the next year is to keep us unto obedience. That we're saying no to former lusts and the lusts and the ideas and the philosophies and the uh, aspirations of sinful human nature that are all around us in this world. But you know, it's not just enough to be no people. No, no, no. None of us likes that kind of person. Nor does the Lord. And no person is actually a nobody spiritually. Because we are to be yes people. Yes, there's a no and there's a yes. And the yes, look at how Peter puts it. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. You see, there's the flip side. We're called to um, the obedience of holiness of likeness to Jesus. And so um, um, we're kept onto obedience. And brethren, think about what this means in the midst of our trials. To be kept onto obedience. The trust that is needed in the midst of trials. Um, and um, also, the sweetness and the cheerfulness. Is it not true that in trials we can become bitter? And we can be embittered by trials towards the Lord. And so, if we're going to be kept in the midst of our trials unto obedience, then it means um, having that trust, having that sweetness about us, having that um, hope, that cheerfulness. And um, if our trials are caused by other people and what they do to us, what they say about us, what they think of us, um, then part of this obedience in the midst of trials is that we will not repay evil with evil. But rather we will say vengeance belongs to the Lord. And the Lord will repay. And we have to, part of this obedience is having that ability to say, Lord, I'm leaving that with you. I cannot sort that out. Uh, the way in which 
this person has treated me. And sometimes it's the way in which other Christians have treated us. And we've got to say, Lord, I'm leaving it with you. I'm not going to try and sort it out myself. I'm not going to be embittered by it. Um, I'm not going to try and resolve it myself. I'm not going to repay evil for evil. I'm not going to give as good as I have gotten. So as obedient children. And it seems that there is some kind of challenge here in, um, or some kind of yeah, challenge or difficulty would be a good way of putting it, uh, in the churches in this region at this time. Because look at what Peter writes in verse 22. Since you have been purified, your souls, uh, since, sorry, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, that's what you've committed yourselves to, through the Spirit. And what does he ask for? Sincere love of the brethren. Love one another fervently. Love one another with a pure heart. And you see, that's as opposed to a heart that's bitter or embittered. Um, and um, you are long enough in the Christian faith, as am I, to know that not all of us are equally easy to love. And we all have our quirks. And we all have our sins. We all have our weaknesses. Um, and you will experience that. We will experience that in our relationships with one another. Even in making decisions. But brethren, if we are going to be kept unto obedience, that means I will love my brother. I will love my sister in Christ, no matter what they say, no matter what they do. Um, I will love them, because that's my calling. It's the Lord's calling to judge them. It's the Lord's calling and prerogative to correct them and to discipline them. Of course, unless um, there's something that elders have been delegated to do and asked to do. But as far as I'm talking here about us as fellow believers, talking about us in the life of our congregation. So brethren, we're kept, we're being kept unto obedience. Obedience that says no to sin. Obedience that says yes to holiness. And that not just in our personal lives, but in our corporate life as a congregation, to the extent that there will be this fervent, strong, sincere love of one another, even as Christ loves us, you, me, despite our remaining sin. But then let's notice thirdly this evening, kept until the return of Christ. Kept until the return of Christ. And here we come back to verse 5 and we note, up, we note a couple of other expressions that fix the return of Christ very, very firmly as the uh, headline of our lives. It's the headline. And it's to be the headline of our lives every single day. If somebody says to you, what's the news today with you? In our hearts and in our minds, um, the news should be, Jesus Christ is returning. That's the most significant thing. It's not how work's going. It's not what's happening in our families. Uh, it's not uh, what's happening in the world around us. It's not what's happening with COVID. Those things are significant. They do matter to us, but they are not the most significant. They're not the headlines. They're not the front page story. The front page story of 
your life and my life and of the life of this church is to be. Jesus Christ is coming and we are being kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's what we're looking for. That's what life's about. That's what makes us tick. It is the salvation that is ready to be revealed. And notice, it's ready. When something's ready, when the dinner's ready, you get the knife and the fork and you get tucked in. And um, when you're ready to come uh, for church, you get into the car and you drive here. And so salvation, this salvation, the inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and will not fade away, it's ready. There's not another thing to be added. Somebody might say to us, are you ready? Are you ready for Tuesday? Are you ready for whatever? Uh, are you ready for, um, for going back to school or going back to university? Uh, and we know what they mean. And we as believers, we as the church, we are to be ready uh, for uh, the revelation of our salvation uh, in the last time. Notice that in verse 5 you have the last time and then later on you have verse 20 these last times and again there's a there's a there is a, a length to this spread the end times the last times ending in the end time and it's from the first coming of Christ right the way through to that final moment when he will come again in his glory. And that's the point that Peter has his readers focused on here. So being kept for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last uh, time. And um, this is, brethren, the next great event on the Christian calendar. It's the only event from God's perspective that is on the Christian calendar. And it's the only event that should be on the church calendar. We live with the decisions of the past, don't we? And we live with the realities of what has happened down through 2,000 years of church history. And we live with the idea, or we have in our, um, in our awareness, the idea of the Christian calendar. The church calendar. And if you stop to think about that, it is just totally on scripture. Because what it is, as far as I can see, is going through the same events year after year in a cyclical or circular motion. And um, so uh, wherever you want to begin, uh, end of November, the Annunciation. And then you have the Advent which lasts for a month, for four weeks. Then the next big event in the Christian calendar is Lent. Um, and um, then you have Easter. And then you have Ascension. And then you have Pentecost. But there's something missing, isn't there? From that Christian calendar. And in fact, it's missing what is most important. And it's missing... And its focus is in the wrong things, in the wrong place. Its focus is on celebrating historical events. 
instead of anticipating the outstanding event, the remaining event, which is the coming of Christ. There should be only one event on the calendar of the Christian church um, that we look forward to and that we anticipate and that is the return of Christ. Yes, the historical events, they are to transform and change our lives and we are to be changed by our understanding of them and what Christ did in his incarnation, becoming a human being, why that was necessary, what he did then in his work, his death, resurrection, his ascension. Those are historical and our lives are to be built upon those. And that because that's what our salvation, the already of salvation is based on. But we are not to build um, our, uh, we're to build our focus in the church and in for the future, not in an endless cyclical celebration or recognition of these, so that the church goes just goes round and round in circles. History is linear. History is linear. It's a line. Not always a straight line, but it's a, a line that's going forward. And the forward event, the one remaining event on God's calendar for Christ and for the church is his coming again. And it's part of the tragedy and the subtlety of the work of the devil that he gets us to focus in the wrong place. To focus in the wrong place and to, um, uh, to miss the outstanding event, the return of Christ. And it's striking that in the Christian calendar so-called, there's no day set aside to remind our world of the second coming of Christ. And notice what he's going to come to do. He's going to come to judge. Look at what uh, Peter writes in verse 17. Uh, that he says uh, to conduct themselves. Uh, and he goes on to talk about uh, the coming of Christ again. And Christ is coming to judge. I just can't get the exact verse uh, at the moment. Um, but he's coming to judge. Uh, yes, verse 17. And if you call in the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work. That's the great reality. So brethren, let's have the headlines. Let's be like newspapers. And with a headline. And with a lead story. As a church. And it is the coming of Christ in his glory. The coming of Christ to judge the world. For you who believe that judgment and who are saved, that judgment holds no terror. It's the judgment of reward. For you who do not believe, it is a judgment full of terror. Because you will... Be reminded of every sin you have committed and every opportunity that you've had to repent and to believe and to be saved and to be obedient unto Christ. And every time you've walked away from it. And so brethren and any non-Christian who hears this message, how are we to live? Well, we're to live in reverence, we who believe. Verse 17, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning or your residing here in fear, in awe, in reverence of the Lord. 
And we're to live, secondly, in readiness. In readiness for the salvation to be revealed. Um, and um, we're to live knowing that in principle we are ready, but knowing and working so that we're ready in practice in our lives. And then um, we are to um, live uh, in hope. Couldn't find another R. If you can think of one, I'd gladly accept it. Um, and verse 3, there's this note of hope that comes out again. And again, verse 3, verse 21. We're to live in hope. And that's not hope. Well, tomorrow I hope to do this or that. It's assurance. To live in assurance. To live in confidence. Um, and uh, notice also at verse um, 7, there's this phrase. And also in verse 13, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you're not a Christian tonight, then this passage also sets out clearly what you are to do. Because you are to repent. And you are to lay hold of Christ. Cry out to him in faith. And ask him to save you. You need to be born again of the Spirit of God. And by the word of God so that you're a new creation and you need to cry out Lord cause me to be born again bring me to new birth grant me repentance grant me faith so brethren what a wonderful passage kept being kept for salvation by the power of God uh, through faith in the midst of trials unto obedience and till the return of Christ. Amen.